Hello, Pod Smashers of the Internet, and welcome to another episode of 80 Bit Pod Smash! Where gaming goes to grab a beer. We are your hosts, Penguin and Termite. I'm Penguin. I am Termite. And we are a weekly video game podcast, smashing together ideas of things that you care about, topically with video games. Topically, like, oh, I put this cream on topically. Yeah, why not? <laughs> it, ails, it cures whatever ails you this Ooh, week. Ooh, uh, speaking of ales, what hey, are we drinking tonight? Yes, a good segue. We are drinking Smart Mouth Brewing Company from Norfolk, Virginia's Alter Ego. Alter Ego Farmhouse Saison Ale. Yeah, yes. that was good. That was one of our better segues. Sometimes they are not so smooth. <laughs> we do what we can. So I'll read the back and then we'll talk about our impressions. The back of it says, release your inner spirit with Alter Ego, an effervescent and refreshing beer with fruity notes and a dry finish. Brewed in Belgian style, this saison is a shout out to the Alter Ego in each of us. Mm, Like Penguin Man. Not only does it pair well with shellfish and ripe soft cheeses, it also inspired a certain lawyer to quit his job and go start a brewery. Aww. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. It's everybody's dream, right? So what do you think about this beer? I love farmhouse ales. Mm-hmm. And this is a Saison, which has the little extra sour, like, yeah, I love side taste on your tongues. I guess that's like what you get with the whole Belgian style. It's weird to me because Saison is so clearly a French word. And, uh-huh. um, a Saison. And uh, they said it's Belgian style, which is kind of funny to me, but. You like my French accent? It's just. Oh, you know, Saison. Just, oh, yours is way better. Uh, it's, How about it that? definitely has like. What I like about Saison's and what I like about this is it's kind of like it goes through this like wash of flavors really quick. So it's like, boom, you're immediately hit with that sweet fruity note. And then like, so, and then it, it goes from sweet to dry to bitter and like, whoop, by the time it hits the back of your mouth. So it's almost like it's hitting all those. I know that the whole like zones, the like taste bud zones are mm-hmm. actually, that's, that's bunk. That's not actually real science, but, um, it still kind of feels that way. It's like, it's like, oh, as it goes back down your mouth, you get like different. A different like flavor profile, so it's good. I like it a lot. Speaking of real science, this can is covered oh, I love in it. mathematical equations. Yeah, my favorite part is they do list the actual ABV, which is six point two percent. However, on the other side of that, they have an actual like they have ABV equals, and then there's just a crazy formula, which I'm I'm wondering if it actually will come out to six point probably two percent yeah. if you actually know the math and were to do the math. I just think that's clever. Yep. So. Way to go, Smart House. Your cans have impressed us. So, we love it. Yeah. All right. Tonight, we have a special episode for you all. We are talking about... We're going to be talking... We're going to be revisiting games as art. Uh, we are celebrating the fact that we have had a roughly 100 listens to our very first episode where we talked about games as art. If you Roger Ebert came out and said that games will never be art. Yeah. And so we took him to task. We took that whole argument to task. And we and went into a deep dive. We did. We went a huge discussion about, like, it was our very first, very 80-bit pod smashy episode. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, if you want to hear more about that actual discussion, then you can revisit that episode. But we're, we're, we're since we've caught 100 of those listens, which to me, I realize is 100 people hearing us talk about the way we poop. Which is kind oh, of funny. I forgot about that. Uh, that's we the, did. That, that was like that was our, our first intro. banter. It was that was weird. our icebreaker. Uh, yeah, very much breaking. It. it broke something. Um, <laughs> so that that was kind of funny. But yeah, so we've had about a hundred. We've had ninety four unique downloads, and then plus some Spotify sprinkles, plus some Spotify listens, some YouTube. some YouTubes. Yeah, so we we took that all together, and we said hundred listens. So tonight we're going to be revisiting that idea of games as art. Yes. Um, but we're going to be zeroing in on the part that I thought was most special about that episode, which is where we picked some specific games and talked about their artistic merits, why yes. we think that those games are should be considered art a lot and of should games be came talked about. Then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. A lot of games have come out since then, and there's been a lot of really good other contenders. So that's what we're going to be talking about tonight. We each picked a couple other games that maybe have come out in the recent years, or maybe they're older games, but um, some of them we've talked about a lot before, some of them we've talked about only a little bit, or some we haven't talked about at all. And we're going to be talking about the artistic merits of some specific games so that's what you have to look forward to tonight. Until we get to that point, we always want to just sort of talk about updates, things going on in our lives or in the world. What's going on? First off, I want to thank each and every one of our listeners. Yeah. It's because of awesome. you and you talking about us and, and social media interactive us, yeah. and being subscri- subscribing to us that we got to 100 listens on episode mm-hmm. one. So if you haven't heard episode one, go back and hit it up and 
help yeah, us out. Just boost our numbers more. If not, that's fine. You can listen to this one and get the gist. That's right. right. So thank you very much for listening to us. Maybe one day we'll have one of our other episodes surpass episode one. And listen, that, that would be cool. amazing. Yeah, that'd be pretty if cool. If you want to give us feedback, I'm going to give you guys the layout right now. You know, <laughs> normally we don't do this till later, but here we go. You can find us at 80bitpodsmash.com. That's our landing website. We have links to Google, Play, iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, iHeartRadio, or any other podcast service you would like. If we're not somewhere you want us to be, let us know and we'll put ourselves there. Interact with us on social media platforms such as Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Reddit where we are 80BIT Podsmash, so at us on at Twitter. At us, at us. And go to our subreddit and read some of our threads Don't and our conversations. Don't at me, but do. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Do we have links to our individual Twitter accounts in our I don't have. Smash? Well, I do have an individual Twitter account, but I haven't logged into it in years because I don't think that I have used it. I mean, I haven't used it in years, mm. so maybe I need to be more active on Twitter. And but. you have made an exciting little purchase. I did. I kind purchased. of tickle our audience's fancy. Yeah. <laughs> With my Anthem blood money, I um, I got uh, I got refunded on Anthem. I think I talked about that a couple couple weeks ago. as my favorite thing. So I got my refund back, and so with sitting on $50 of Amazon gift card money, I was considering purchasing Rage 2, but the reviews came out kind of mediocre. Mm-hmm. Not enough for me to be like, I want I want to pay full price for it. I'm happy to grab it on sale. It's kind of my same philosophy on Days Gone, yeah. uh, which is another game that similarly came out that was highly anticipated, mm-hmm. but kind of wasn't you know reviewed very well. So instead of buying either of those games, I decided to go ahead and drop a little bit of cash that I got refunded anyways on a camera for my PlayStation 4, which Ooh. means you might see my ugly mug on some streams coming up. Yes. So I'm not quite sure exactly. I don't necessarily have a plan, but I might just start doing it. You know, if you build it, they'll That's come. That's how you do, yeah. And we definitely have... will be using it as a way of hopefully attracting some new viewers into the po- – no, mm-hmm. viewers, new listeners into the podcast. So we do have a Twitch channel. We do. It's 80-Bit Pod Smash. Yeah. And so <laughs> I'll probably come up with some fun antics to do, but I'll be streaming uh, myself playing PlayStation games, probably just some Borderlands for now. And that'll um, liven up our YouTube channel yeah. because everything that's recorded live, when it's done, it can be uploaded boop, boop. to YouTube. Yeah. So, so there should be some fun stuff. So yeah, yep. keep an eye out for some stuff. To right, we'll probably also do some streaming. We may even just share the camera back and forth for a while That'd until he can afford his arm, um, yeah. return. We might do more actual streaming stuff. Um together too so mm-hmm. which will be fun somehow you can do that and i don't know how oh interesting i don't know It'll we'll figure it out maybe so, we have to use obs and tap into the same server and maybe. do some pc gaming Her. magic yeah we'll find out we'll figure it out we'll we'll just uh, we're gonna be experimenting so it's a brand exciting new age yes so we'll be pioneering well, that cool. is there anything else you want to talk about anything going on major this black friday is going to be stacked for me i can't wait because you just mentioned Rage 2 being a cool, like, discount. Uh, I don't have yeah. any news. I mean, there's, I don't know what's been going on. I do, because I listen to a daily news podcast. But I don't think there's anything earth-shaking Everyone's in the industry kinda, right like, now. Everyone's kind of, like, pulling their announcements until This E3, is like so. when a huge tsunami is on the way. Yeah. All the water retracts. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. Well, the water is all the news. Yeah. And the tsunami is E3. E3 yeah. So it's, like, it's coming. Yeah, stay tuned for our E3 plans. And we'll be talking about yeah, that coming definitely. up soon. So. so this Black Friday... Because I'm just guessing. I'm just throwing a date out there in the fall. We have Mortal Kombat 11, Days Gone, and now Rage 2 are all three games I want to play that I don't want to buy $60. Yeah. Or buy at $60. They'll probably be on sale before then. You might be able to spread it out. Maybe, yeah. But you definitely buy Black Friday, you're going to want to grab them. And it's weird because 2019... But dude, you've also got... I guess you're going to borrow them from me, but if you wanted to purchase them, you've got Devil May Cry 5 and Resident Evil 2. I know. There's like five games that are not worth $60. (laughs) Well, Resident Evil 2, I would say, is worth $60. Devil May Cry 5, definitely. It's it's on the fence, but Mm. I I don't regret spending $60 on Devil May Cry. It'll be exciting. I can't wait. Uh, but it's weird. 2019. Let's talk about this because you mentioned it. You, yeah. you Facebook messaged me. Yeah, I did. About the, the churn of games in 2019. Just comparing. How, like, comparing it to 2018 comparing it and to 17. 17, 18, yeah, since we've been Which have been podcast. amazing years. Yeah. 2018 saw, well, 2017 saw Game of the Year was Horizon Zero Dawn versus Zelda Breath of the Wild. Yeah. So we had that caliper of games. Yeah, and, and they both came out in spring. They both came out in. They did like really. We're close just specifically to each other. talking about spring, like because in the release windows, there's always going to be good games that come out in the fall. Mm-hmm. There may be some handful of smattering of games in the summer, mm-hmm. and uh, January, as we mentioned, Q1 is becoming more of an interesting release. Yeah, over window. the last three years, but really, it's like spring has. I mean, spring has become a really good contender for some games too, because like you said, we saw HDD, Horizon Zero Dawn, and Breath of the Wild in mm-hmm. 2017. 2018 brought us God of War. Yep. 
in 2019. Well, there's Red Dead Redemption 2 in 2018 that came out in the winter, or fall. Like yeah, October. Yeah. But that's what I mean. That's why I mean. we're talking about contending. the spring. We're talking about the spring release, yeah. though. The mm-hmm. spring release window in the past two years, we've saw we've seen some pretty just big, huge home run games. God of War is still winning awards. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Breath of the Wild too is still yeah. winning awards. Like it's awesome. Not Breath of the Wild too. Breath of the Wild as, as well. well. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, this spring, but 2019, yeah. it has been pretty weak. Like it started off with Anthem, which we've talked to death about and don't right. need to get into. Just a complete failure. And then the two other most anticipated games were Rage 2 and Days Gone. Days Gone. And both of them have been received very lukewarm mm-hmm. reception. Yeah. So the rest of the spring, I can't think of anything else that's really highly anticipated right. in AAA titles. That... I think Mario Maker 2 is in June before summer. So technically like, before the release. So technically, yeah. yeah. So that was kind of interesting theoretically be the biggest game. In the, the two spring. biggest games that I think, the two the two best games that have come out this year have been Resident Evil 2 and Di- uh, Diablo, <laughs> Devil May Cry 5, and those both came out in that Q1 mm-hmm. release, so that's just kind of interesting that so far this year, this this Q2 has been overshadowed by Q1. Yeah, it has, interesting. and microtransaction controversies aside, Mortal Kombat 11 reviewed very well as well. Mm-hmm. It's, it's good. Yeah, and Division 2, yeah, but again, Ooh, but, yeah, n- but none two. of them are like game-breaking, like both Mortal Kombat... Mm-hmm. Both Mortal Kombat and The Division are kind of more of the same. Yeah. Whereas Horizon Zero Dawn was 100% brand new IP. Right. Breath of the Wild was a completely... Breath of the Wild and God of War were both completely fresh new directions mm-hmm. for their respective franchises and one game of the year. I don't think we're going to see Division 2 right. win game of the year. That's kind of crazy. The Division be- 2 might be in contention for like best multiplayer. And mm-hmm. Mortal Kombat 11 is probably in contention for best fighting game. Yeah, like, yeah, so we but- have those kind of genre... Yeah, but if like you just think things, about it, like if you overall, look at the past, but like yeah, looking at the past two years, the thought it literally just occurred to me: 2017 and 2018 saw Q2 games both win Game of the Year. Mm-hmm. I don't think we're going to see that in 2019. Yeah. We're, we're, sorry, I can probably safely say we're not going to see that in 2019. Yeah. So it's kind of interesting, but mm-hmm. cool. Yeah. Well, Q2 has been a pretty underwhelming thing, yes. but <gasps> doing, doing this podcast, podcast is our favorite, favorite thing. thing. Ooh, doing, doing this podcast, podcast is our favorite. favorite thing <laughs> remember how i said i sometimes we hit those segues and sometimes we don't it's perfect uh, cool uh favorite thing you had a favorite thing oh that you my definitely gosh want to talk about. i do want to talk about this this episode will go live after our beer pairing episode yes after our beer pairing episode See, so. uh it's sorry for the long delay because the movie will have come out. Yeah, my favorite will have been thing out for a while. is Detective Pikachu. Mm, I saw it, tell me about it Thursday night, release night at 9 p.m. Just don't spoil it, but tell me about I won't, it. Yeah, that's <laughs> why I was also thinking about the time frame when the episode goes live. About spoilers, but if you haven't seen it yet, I can't spoil it for you. So, oh my gosh, Dan. <laughs> okay, this movie is so Dan, good. who's Dan? Call me by my name. <laughs> Penguin. Oh my gosh, Penguin. So, if you know who Termite is, whenever something I love dearly through media manifests itself in something that's more real to me uh-huh. i get stupid emotional over it okay and a dumb example of this is like a nascar race okay i'm gonna be very vulnerable here <laughs> i was raised w- watching nascar on tv seeing like my favorite people like drivers and stuff right mm-hmm. when i went to a race as an adult and saw these people in real life i got emotional now, yeah. I'm not, like, bawling like a sad little boy. Sure, but you know, you're boy. just filled up inside. But, you yeah, I'm like, like, like okay, yeah. the second opening scene scene in Detective Pikachu, because there's, like, a prelude. Okay. And then it's like, okay, now we're introduced to the main character. Okay. Is a camera shot across the field where you see Doduos and Dodrios running across the field and mm-hmm. some Pidgey and Pidgeots flying. And they they chime up this music that has been derived from the like Game Boy chiptune, but oh, modernized nice. with orchestra stuff laid over it. Music. Do, 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 and it's like, do, 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 do. oh it my like gosh. Like I, my jaw just dropped. I was like, they nailed it. Yeah. Nice. They freaking did it. They put Pokemon in the real world the way that like I a live action Pokemon. Yep. imagined it would be in real life. And it's not really, this isn't a spoiler, but the, he tries to catch a Cubone. And so there's a Pokeball like shown in the act of catching a Pokemon and what it would look like in real world. It's all done so well. It's so good. Nice. And then he later goes to the big city, which is in the trailers, Rhyme City. It's all neon lights. There's Easter eggs everywhere. There's like respect paid. I don't know if you call it fan service to the anime in various mm-hmm. ways. Pokemon interacting with humans in real world. And they just look so good. And like the art direction and the art style is awesome. The music's phenomenal. Now, it's not a perfect movie. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> so there, there is like the antagonist is kind of flat. Okay. The motivations are like, 
okay, that's contrived. Yeah, yeah. And there's a side character. She's a journalist who I don't know if this is bad acting because I've never seen her in anything else, but it's obviously just like canned. She has no purpose in the plot at all but to just move things forward. She's a complete plot device as her character, and I'm sad if like that was existent. I'm like, come on, you can give her some depth. But she doesn't have any depth. Mm. And all of that is overshadowed by the relationship between the main character and Detective Pikachu. The reason Pikachu can talk matters, which I didn't know that from, mm-hmm. from the trailers. You yeah. just think that it is. No, that's very integral to the story. Okay. And... The relation, like I said, the relationship, they're centering on it, they're building it up. The main character's got baggage, he's got emotional things, he's got weight to it. Pikachu has weight to why he's doing what he's doing, and the plot moves forward. If you, that overshadows all, all of the bad antagonists nice. and the terrible side characters. So, real quick, you can answer this quick, but I have a question for you. In, in a few, in one of our early episodes, we talked about movie adaptations of video games yes. and, and why they're kind of. Mostly miss. <laughs> and we also, in that episode, talked about what it would take to make a good movie adaptation. Mm-hmm. Based on that conversation and based on you having seen the movie, do you think this is... A, do you think this is a good video game movie adaptation? Yes. Okay. Do you think it's, like, the start of what could possibly be, like, a new wave of, like... In the same way that Iron Man was kind of the start of a wave of comic book faithful comic book adaptations do you think this might be similarly the a new wave of a faithful like video game adaptation like string of faithful video game adaptation movies did you hack my google account and read <laughs> my notes no i because just, I'm, I'm gonna read I've thought this. about the same thing very few moments in my life have hit me like this i don't know how to describe it it was the feeling i got when i watched the teenage mutant ninja turtles movies of the 90s when the first x-men movie came out and now with detective pikachu it's a mixture of love for content and a validation that the thing i've loved on my own is now shared with the world mm-hmm. it's a weird strange feeling but it's exactly that you've nice. nailed it nice. x-men was the introduction to me as superheroes existing on the big screen in a way that's good now i know since between the original x-men yeah, movie no, and you. iron man there have been some bad things fantastic uh-huh. four aside but iron man really was like the the yeah. max it was like hey like, this can work this whole cinematic yes. universe thing can work yeah yep. and uh-huh. so detective pikachu is by far the best video game movie adaptation ever made uh-huh. and I know that bar is low so yeah, it wouldn't take much yeah. uh-huh. but this if it wasn't based on a video game would be a good movie yeah. so it's all re- it's like uh, I was a fan of the original Mario movie uh-huh. the live acted one that everyone hates I yeah. think it's great uh, you can at me at that <laughs> uh, I love don't at me I loved the Mortal Kombat movie uh, oh yeah, yeah. I didn't yeah. like the Street Fighter movie too much, and we, you know, we had that whole episode. So you can go back and hear my thoughts on mm-hmm. that. But yes, Detective Pikachu is—they've nailed the atmosphere, the world building, and the feel of Pokemon. If they made a sequel that had like focus on Ash or like do something with the Pokemon League or take a different turn, because this is just Detective Pikachu. It's not you know collect gym badges, right? Get not, to the Pokemon League. So there's like one it doesn't really follow the same like story arc as the games right. typically do. Yeah, and there's only like two battle scenes in the whole thing. It's not based. It's this is a story narrative driven kind of movie. It's not a Pokemon battle movie, but they could make one and it would be mm-hmm. awesome. So yes. yeah, with Sonic coming out this year too, and then with them actually saying we're going to change his appearance to yeah. be more faithful to the games, like it seems like we might be kind of reaching that tipping point where if it, if Sonic does well too. Which I, I I do genuinely want it to, even though its initial impressions have been pretty blasted. You know, I think that if they do change the design up, that's really the only problem people have with it. Right. And if it's good and faithful to the video games, then like we could see kind it of a new like... wave. And I personally want the Nintendo Cinematic Universe to be a thing. Me too. And, and the, the makers of the Detective Smat- yeah. Pikachu talked about. They Smash said Bros. That they could do it. Yeah. They yeah. said they were like, if you just if you had a bunch of standalone, that's what made the Marvel Cinematic Universe good. Is that standalone movies? Yeah. Like the standalone, you gotta get you gotta get to know the heroes alone and then you bring them together and if right. they were to do that like a zelda movie a mario movie a kirby movie a star fox movie and then bring them all together in super smash bros oh it'd be, pretty, it'd be amazing pretty cool but anyways my favorite thing i'm gonna be really quick there is a i was listening to an audiobook a new audiobook that i blasted through and of mm-hmm. course it's brandon sanderson so I'm, I'm being a sander fan again but it's one of his non-cosmere novels so it's one of his novels that doesn't take place in his like shared universe of uh-huh. novels so it takes place outside of that so it's its own story it's called skyward it really reminded me of like 
a more optimistic version of like Ender's Game. So it's like, huh. so it's like you know, you're fl- they're flying around in starfighters, but they like train in a hologram. Yeah. So really cool. The char- the main character is just amazing. She's like this precocious young girl who that's a word what's precocious precocious like she's just kind of like she's aggressive she's totally just doesn't take people's crap and she's kind of like out there and just kind of puts herself out there and like some of her like opening lines she's just like she's very aggressive and she's just she'll say things like she's like was raised on stories of like beowulf and stuff so she's always like i shall stand upon your smoldering corpse and your lamentations shall rise to the heavens like whenever people get in her way she just like goes off on these like epic like you will weep when i crush you (laughs) it's amazing (laughs) your cries shall rise to the heavens i just i love her so much so skyward brandon sanderson check it out it's good it's it's pretty good so cool that's my favorite thing now we can go on to our next segment, which is <laughs> bow, 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 bow. DLC. LC. So you start off talking really fast, and then you slow, slow it down. down. Yep. DLC. DLC. Uh, Downloadable the, content. Yeah. It's a little extra bit. Yeah. Something that we add to our show that doesn't cost you anything more than our podcast does. And, and it's a little fun discussion. It kind of can center around video games or whatever, and uh, it's more of just like, Oh, I wouldn't really think to have that conversation. So given the sort of weird nature of the conversations of DLC, I came up with a question which is related to our topic in this way, in the sense Mm -hmm. that there's kind of two ways you could get 100 listens to something. Yeah. Either you have 100 different people listen to something Uh one time, or you could have one person sit there and listen to it 100 times. (laughs) Okay. So in that vein... I think about, like, in my life, is there any piece of media, whether it be a book, a movie, a game, that I have consumed 100 times? So that's the question. Is there anything that you think, over the course of your entire life, you have played this game, seen this movie, watched this show, read this book, one hundred? that you could say that you did, you've done it 100 times? Running. No, it has to be a specific no. thing. Like it has to be a specific, <laughs> not not running, because I could just say, yeah, I've breathed a hundred, I've I've eaten cereal a hundred times. No, I mean, like, <laughs> is there anything that, like, any specific thing that you've consumed, piece of media that you can say you've consumed a hundred times? No, even when I, you're a kid, like, and you watch something over and over again. Okay. No, not a hundred. What a comes lot. to close? What comes close? It's a lot. I know it's a lot. That's why I was like, man, I can't think of anything. I mean, you have to break it down. So if you, I think of video games, like how many times have I played Mario three in my life? A lot, but mm-hmm, not a hundred. But not a hundred. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I always revisit old retro games, like mm-hmm. constantly. So I'm thinking of like my Super Nintendo favorites: Mario World, Zelda: Link to the Past, O Queen of Time, Majora's Mask. But not a hundred. Yeah. I think of the time. So the only thing I could come close to is like when I was a kid and would just watch the same movie every single day for like months at a time, if not years. Wow. Uh, that was just the thing that I, I don't know if other, I'm sure there are other people who have done, other people who have done well, that. Well, back in the VHS days, you could watch it so much that yeah. you wore the tape out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I, so I, I never think, did that. I think the, the close contenders, I don't know, I, I can't know if I can say if it's been a hundred, but it's probably come close. I've probably seen Jurassic Park, the first oh, original that Jurassic so Park. so good. I've probably seen it 100 times. Yeah. That, I would say Lion King comes close as a contender uh-huh. and Jumanji. Those were like my Ooh, movies. I watched movies. those three movies. At different periods of time in my life, I yeah. would watch like I would watch Jumanji every day. Come home from school, pop Jumanji, and watch Jumanji. So I'm probably, wow. I'm pretty sure I could probably say that I watched Jumanji a hundred times. That's crazy. Yeah, I think so. So there's nothing you can think of. Nothing. No. Comparable? I mean, I watched Toy Story a ton. I watched the original X Men movie a ton. I also watched Back to the Future a ton. I never really revisited TV because we didn't have the technology to record right. tv except for vcrs which i never used as a recording device mm-hmm. except for in like big events and stuff but no there's a hundred is a lot it is a lot yeah i can't even it's say for lot. certainty that i saw but like if i think about like i mean oh, i have yeah. over 100 hours in a couple of games i've definitely caught more than 100 pokemon yeah. like, i just I mean, think that like there's 30 30 days in a in month, a month. Mm-hmm. so it only three take months like straight. three months pretty much to only. watch yeah, well, but as a kid, I'm like, yeah, I probably did that. I probably did that with movies. Ninja Turtles, I watched a ton. Power Rangers, the the movie, the, I've the been Power Rangers movie, yeah, yeah interesting, mm-hmm. cool. I, there's a lot of movies I watched a lot, but yeah. never, not even close to 100. I'd say like 20 or 30 at the most. <laughs> yeah, uh, well, every day, every day, I would watch those movies, oh, some man. of those movies. Yeah, 
I would get bored after My sisters a while. got so mad at because they would just like I would just occupy the TV for the two hours it took to get through Jurassic Park. <laughs> <laughs> and that movie's amazing. It is amazing. That's it's arguably amazing, my yeah. favorite single movie of all time. Interesting. Yeah. That's yeah. A, such a good movie. Yeah. But cool. Well, I guess that's DLC then. Bow, 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 bow. DLC. Yeah. So now we can go to our main topic. We Are video games even art? <laughs> do do video games even art? <laughs> Yeah, uh, they are. Hold on, I'm trying to. Pull. So we, we're so obviously on the side of that video games are art. Yeah, we're not going to argue. Yeah, that we're not right going to. We're not going to break it down. We're just going to start with that. We're just going to start with that. Yeah, video games totally are art. And when we say that, I guess it's probably helpful to clarify. We don't what just mean art? that. Like, oh, video games have like great artistic graphics, or video games have the music is art, or even the story. Like all those things, sure, they are artistic in and of themselves. Mm-hmm. They they count as art in and of themselves yep. if i were to go listen to the halo soundtrack for example no one would argue with me that the music in halo is art however what we talk about and what you know the question is what the what people argue about is whether video games is a holistic experience including things like gameplay level design uh, mechanics like all of those things yep. can be considered art mm-hmm. and what it's we the argue whole of the, the holistic experience yeah mm-hmm. everything together is that can you say the experience is an artistic experience in the same way that looking at a painting is an artistic experience? Mm-hmm. Going to see a play, um, watching a movie, like is it is it art? Is it games? Is it entertainment? We make a pretty good argument, I think, in our episode, our first episode, mm-hmm. that, it, that it is art. So that's yeah, that's what we're gonna be we're gonna be talking about. We've talked before about how video games, the term games, may no longer be a suitable definition just because of all the varied experiences yeah we touched on that first episode i wanted to reapproach that i wanted to look at it again yeah sure that's no problem we have talked about that a a lot over the course of our podcast mm -hmm. we brought it up in several episodes we have but if you want to break it down a little bit more yeah and like games as we kind of think of them could be getting a certain score or a competition where you overtake someone else in a competitive thing right in the same way like a sport is that's why the term esports right. can be applicable the olympic games mm-hmm. where you have countries competing against each other for medals yeah it, right for the ultimate glory and are the modern video games like we've now been doing this podcast almost two years have is the word games still even applicable to what we have experienced right because because on the one hand you have games like call of duty which is totally just an esport it's totally mm-hmm. about just skill and the entire experience is just about getting better and beating other people. Mm-hmm. Um, therefore, the term esport is applicable because it is about gaining skills, gaining gaining the skills you need to overtake opponents. Whereas a game like uh, Obra Dinn, for example, yeah. I haven't played it myself, but I've heard it's an incredibly artistic experience. Mm-hmm. It's much more about trying to impart a feeling on you yeah. in the same way that that's what we talk about with art is art is usually intended to try to make you feel something, make mm-hmm. you have an experience. And there's lots of games that I would say qualify as art under that definition of making you f- trying to make you feel something through not just the music, not just the story, but mm-hmm. also through the gameplay, through the atmosphere, through the level design. All of those components come together. Everything that makes a game a game coming together to make you feel something, to give you some kind of impression. Mm-hmm. Um, so in that regard, can you call it even a game at that point? Right. Because it's not it the of definition of a game. It's not even like, and you'll talk about with one of your examples, that sometimes games even are meant to confound you to not even have fun. Right. The That's term, the point. The idea of play and fun even goes away because they're trying to get you to experience something mm-hmm. because like the, the idea of it being not fun is meant to do something as part of that experience. Mm-hmm. So. So yeah, I think that uh, you know that's that's a great kind of point to bring up. One of the, I mean, we go much deeper into it in the episode we talk about. So if we refer a lot back to episode one in the podcast, then <laughs> there's a reason because we kind of have broken down these ideas, and you guys have probably heard a lot, especially our longtime listeners have heard it. But we'll try to hit like hit the major points. Yeah, I would say before we get into our examples, how are we going to be evaluating each of these games? So. You know, we're going to what are kind of the major things that you you look for to say, because we can probably say every video game to some degree is artistic, but some are more artsy than others. Some are more artistic than others. And Mm -hmm. you would even probably be able to say two games, you know, even the games that we're talking like comparing them, you might even say, well, this game is more I think this game is a better form of like a better art. Yeah. 
than others. And, and that's subjective, but mm-hmm. but because it's subjective, we should probably break down what are you looking for in a game as an artistic experience. The examples I will give are, it's pretty simple. It's does a video game evoke an emotion that's mm-hmm. more than just the fun yeah. of playing mm-hmm. it? Yeah. That's pretty much it. That's kind of my barrier. It's like, which games go deeper? Because to me, the fun of playing games is the first, like that's the shallow... A game has to be fun in some degree. Now, fun can be also defined by the experience, like you just mentioned, yeah. one of the games that we'll talk about. Does, it removes the fun on purpose, yeah. but the removal of that fun in and of itself is fun. Yeah. <laughs> it yeah. sounds yeah, weird. Yeah, yeah. But so like that's what I'm saying. Once it's, you understand what they're trying to get you to right. do. So it does it, it does evoke some sort of emotion or relatability mm-hmm. that you can like you can pour more of yourself into it or yeah. it speaks to you mm-hmm. or it pours into you. Yep. I say that the games I'm looking at primarily, they, the games I'm looking at, number one, they're trying to say something. They're trying to send a message of some kind. Like they're trying to, it's, it's, it's both the emotion. They're trying to make you feel something, but they're also trying to make you challenge you, challenge you. Yeah. Make you try to understand, change the way you think about something. I think the term that people use is pathos. They have pathos. They have, they have more thought. Getting all Greek on us. Yeah. Uh, there's some thought involved too. The word pathos is means thought. And so it makes you, it challenges your thoughts and makes you think about something. So that's kind of the ones that what's kind of what I'm looking for. I'm also looking for, like I was saying, I'm looking, I'm looking for games that express their artistic intentions through more than just their story, their music, their graphics. Okay. They're doing it through the gameplay. So Mm -hmm. the games that I'm, I chose, I chose because the gameplay itself draws you in, not just the story, the music, the graphics, Mm -hmm. the atmosphere. So it's, it's, the the game is designed holistically to make you think and feel something. So that's kind of what I'm looking at. Sweet. Um, why does this matter? Let's let's quickly, quickly, why, why is this even a conversation that's worth having? It is, it has been, Evolving in the last 15 years. Yeah, but for sure. But 15 years ago, let's go back in time a little bit, video games were were just marketed towards young teenage boys as these shallow, explosive experiences. Some had scandalously clad women and the electricity, fire, explosions, and violence, and that was it. And there's still that in a lot of ways. And, and some, yeah, they are. Uh, arcades were a thing. Like Video games were clearly a child-slash-young-teenager thing. And in the 15 years since then, the kids that loved doing that, including myself, at that time have evolved. The workplace, the developers, the publishers have also been now those kids grown up into the industry. And so we're seeing a maturity of video games as a whole. And I want to continue beating this drum of, of video games being an art form because it is maturing to that. Yeah, and we're not just trying to validate our... To the, the way we spend our time we're not just trying to say like oh yeah no i'm not wasting my time playing video games because they're art like <laughs> i fully will admit that games can be a waste of time even when they are artistic mm-hmm. but and it, like some people actually have that point of view there, yeah. are, there are movie buffs who go see every single movie yeah and they will look down on a video gamer as wasting their time there are <laughs> bookworms who will consume book after book after book going to the library and just coming home with novel after novel and just sit and read all the time mm-hmm. and they will condemn someone for playing video yeah. games mm-hmm. and we just want to poke at that kind of hypocrisy yeah but- you know like games are also a relevant entertainment yeah. experience to our culture and society and they help us grow and when you and the other thing is when the other thing that I think is most important and we and again this is hit upon in episode one but it's definitely worth mentioning is um, when you say your preferred medium of when you tell an artist that your preferred medium of expression does not count as art, then you are basically whether you're in whether it's your intended intention or not, you're basically trying to stifle their ability to create art. You're trying to tell them, no, it's not good enough. No, you should be writing. No, you should be painting. No, you should be mm-hmm. you should be you know Sculpting. a cinematographer, or whatever. Like filming, you, yeah, filmmaking, yeah. Mm-hmm. So to say, no, budding artist, you shouldn't waste your time trying to make a video game. You're only going to not make good art. Mm-hmm. Means that all of us get less art in the world. So right. that's why I think it's the that's why I think that the the discussion is worth having because because it means that. Um, we, the world will benefit more when we get the Picasso of video games, you know, when mm-hmm. we get the Shakespeare of video games and we may not be quite there yet, Hideo but we'll, Kojima. but we, he's, yeah, we're close. <laughs> we're very close to kind of reaching that point. So in that vein, let's celebrate some of the artists that some of the, some of the works of art that we have had over the past 15 years. Yeah. And, uh, let's get into it. 
Uh, your choices are very recent, but we'll do like very recent games. Um, mm-hmm. But we'll we'll bounce back and forth. So why don't you hit me with your first one, and then I'll I'll bring up mine. All right, my first one is Red Dead Redemption Two. Ooh boy, it's a Yeehaw. ridiculously thick narrative experience. As boy we talked, howdy, as we talked in the past, just in this episode, this is a game that purposefully intentionally slows you down yep and it will drag you through the mud (laughs) quite literally with yeah with the main character whose story arc and evolution are so relatable and so realistic with dealing with things such as a gaslighting delusional leader to a gang you are arthur morgan who is a I don't know, a member of this gang uh, and the leader Dutch Ditch. continues to bring this gang through mission after mission, robbery after robbery, committing crime after crime in the name of doing something good and yeah. kind of a Robin Hood mentality of we're going to rob from the rich and give it to the poor. But totally not give it but to the poor. But not give it to the poor <laughs> and be selfish and delusional and want to run away from all their problems. And can, like so the, the game setting is in the late 1800s where we have the industrial revolution kind of taking over the wild west Mm -hmm. so technology is changing the way things work uh and the setting is just so like represented in such a beautiful way the landscapes are amazing and super realistic um down to like the animals and how they behave the ai systems in place the npcs in the cities and how they how they're developed Uh, we have like a saint denis is is Mm -hmm. like saint louis and we have all of the the tropes that would have existed in the late 1800s, such as a Thomas Edison sort of inventor that's crazy and trying to do new things as a side quest. That, like we have so much. It ends spoilers. It ends with you like electrocuted, like the whole like, side quest chain ends yeah. with you like executing someone in the electric chair. <laughs> it's yeah, so dark. It is while being also like kind of fun, like mm-hmm. in a dark in a dark way. But that's kind of that really sums up the Red Dead Redemption experience. Is fun in a kind of dark way it's very dark um, and, and it's very i mean you know we we throw we people throw around the term realism without sometimes knowing the roots of realism yeah realism was a artistic movement it was an artistic movement in the late 1800s where in theater productions real is basically i mean it's it you're like it sounds kind of obvious when you when you like say it out loud but realists were trying to make art that was reflective of reality they're trying to hold a mirror up to reality quite Ah. literally and say like so their set piece in theater the set pieces would be very detailed Mm -hmm. and and kind of true to life their their verisimilitude i think is the word Uh, i'm just whipping it out verisimilitude is don't whip it out is this (laughs) yeah right verisimilitude is this idea that like yeah this is true to life true to what is true Mm -hmm. and so that's so realists would say like truth is in what we know as reality where you know like what you see is truth what you can mm-hmm. touch is truth um so in painting again it is what it sounds like they'd basically be trying to create photo realistic mm-hmm. again that word is permeated in our in our language now but you know only 200 150 years ago it was a move it was actually an artistic movement mm-hmm. I, um, and i like what you said with the the intention holding yeah. a mirror up to reality what do you do when you look in a mirror mm-hmm. at yourself right my yeah. hair's not right uh-huh. right yeah oh my glasses don't match my outfit right you try like, to then you then look at it from a third person perspective mm-hmm. and then you apply your, your you apply judgments yeah, yeah you apply judgments judgment to it based on yeah. that third person perspective and you can critique it right mm-hmm. yeah. so red dead redemption has just as much satire of of modern day society yeah even though it's set in the late 1800s right it's not trying to like it's not even trying to make comparisons to cell phone technology or anything like that and yet it's still talks about getting so wrapped up in something an obsession yeah you know it, ta- it still deals hits on themes of obsession while mm-hmm. never having to you know like try to make a comparison to modern day obsession technology yeah yeah it's really good it's so. a fascinating game mm-hmm. it's ridiculously long and super slow yeah i mean you, you but have to that's skin the point. your animals like mm-hmm. and when you skin them it's not like other games where it's like i'm gonna just make sure this green bar completes it completes in two seconds like no you have to like go through and sometimes you have to skin them multiple times there's a little cut scene every time you skin something it's like then you have to, to like pick it up which is uh-huh. a slow process hike it over to your horse which is slow uh-huh. and then lay it onto your horse and then go take it to someone right and, and you, drive so you all can't way, do a drive. bunch at a time yeah right. uh-huh. yeah it's all very one-off and it's yeah. like it's super realistic but it's also slowing you down as a player and it's forcing you right to, in the gameplay yeah it's forcing you to partake of their world they've built for you mm-hmm. and where the details such as foliage animation and its reactions to you as you fly through it on a horse and how the character weaves and dodges 
branches, you know, or the weather that comes in and rain and wind and thunderstorms and how everything interacts together, how people interact with you as a character and the decisions that you make. Yeah. It's, I want to talk about one artistic choice in Red Dead Redemption that technically is a huge spoiler. So uh oh. If you care about spoilers, you might want to skip ahead like five minutes. So we will try not to talk about it for seconds. more than okay. five minutes. But it's a long time. Yeah, it's not going to be five minutes. Yeah, two minutes, two minutes. How about that? Two minutes. I do want to talk about, um, so in the story, this is where we get in the spoilers. You've been warned. You've been warned, yeah. In the story, the main character gets sick with leukemia. Is leukemia? No. No, it's not Tuberculosis. Leukemia. Tuberculosis. Where he coughs up blood. He, tuberculosis, big disease in the 1800s, consumption, they used to call it. He gets sick with tuberculosis, and uh, he just straight up dies. Yeah. The inevitability of that sickness leading to death. You don't get some magic cure. You don't, you don't, I don't know, just like keep toughing it out. Like the care, it leads to the character's end. About halfway through the game, you just like fall off your horse and then you go to the doctor. The doctor's like, yeah, you got leukemia. You're going to die. Tuberculosis. (laughs) Tuberculosis. You've got tuberculosis. (laughs) Where am I getting leukemia from? You're going to die. Just the inevitability of that. Of that, like, again, the, the fact that the game just, like, you, when, you know, Arthur Morgan dies, that's the end of the story, but the, the game's not over. You then play the rest of the end game as John Marston, John Marston from the first mm-hmm. game. So just the fact that, like, they made that gameplay choice. They made not only the choice to, like, your character dies and you play as a new character, but that your character dies not in some heroic gunfight. Your kid doesn't go out in a blaze of glory like old Western. He's, he dies to tuberculosis. And they go one step farther. They uh-huh. don't even just label your character as having tuberculosis they remove the effect that food has on you they limit mm -hmm. it sorry i don't remove it they limit the the healing ability food has on you yep they have you randomly stop in fits of coughing you run out of gunfight quicker you run out of breath quicker like there are gameplay mechanics that are also involved impacted yeah and and all of and telling that like okay you have your main character has tuberculosis you are now gipped (laughs) <laughs> from this point to the yeah. end of the game in some fashion. And so you have to consume more food, which means you have to scrounge for more food or buy more food yeah. or like keep those resources. So in that check. choice like has per or that that artistic choice has permanent consequences mm-hmm. and effect on the gameplay and it's an inevitable thing. You can't right. avoid it. You can't you can't make choices to go against it. It's mm-hmm. not like if you play more as a good guy, you're gonna not get it, tuberculosis. It's it changes great. Arthur's mentality as as he's facing mm-hmm. his own morality yep. in the conversations and dialogue choices that you have later yep. after that. So it's just this it's amazing. It was such a bold choice for a video game. I loved it. That's why it will always be cemented as an incredibly artistic experience in my mind. Yep. Cool. Let's uh, move on to we another. We did a long time on we that. We did, one. but it's such a good one. So it is. you got a good pick. Um, I've got turn. another good pick, and I'm going to say the whole franchise. I would say each game is artistic in its own way, but I really want to zero in on Bioshock One. Yes. Oh my gosh! Before we started this podcast, I had not played the franchise. Mm-hmm. So when we first talked about games as art, you didn't know. I had. I didn't know. I and knew I it was do a good believe game. I mentioned it. You probably did mention it, but now that I actually have played through all three games and like am actually kind of jonesing for another playthrough of all three games. Yes. Oh my gosh! Like truly stands the test of time. Not just at, like for its time. For one, it came out. It came out at a time when first person shooters were your Call of Duties. Yeah, you know, that's what first person shooters the were. The most story driven first person shooter existed at the time I believe was Half-Life 2 or mm, Crisis 1. Yeah, uh-huh, yeah. And that was like the the new And even then there were new just age like first person shooters. Portal was like right yeah. on the cusp of that. It and was then, like this new idea where we're going to tell a story through a first person shooter. Right. So it's not going to be a competitive first person shooter. I mean right. they were doing it with Halo like the campaign but it was still Halo was still a multiplayer game with a cool campaign. Mm. Um BioShock took the idea of telling a story and just made it actually was like hey we're going to tell a good story. We're not going to tell just some shallow space marine fighting his way through alien zombie beasty monsters yeah, we can do a whole podcast like, in the artistic merits of halo i mean it's not <laughs> yeah, bad don't get me wrong no 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 it's good but but you know i mean like all those games crisis and and half-life as good games they are as good as games they are mm-hmm. like i don't think and i would say they're probably art- artistic in their own ways but like i think bioshock is a better art form it's because it was like hey we're gonna tell like a good story and they riff on you know again you know part of my philosophy on games as art is like i want you to tell me tell me like make it make me think through the gameplay itself Mm -hmm. and in two ways does bioshock make me think number one it is a story about predestination if you will determinism it is so Mm -hmm. like like again throughout the entire game you don't have choices you have to you have to go where the level design tells you to go like you can't just like wander around it's not an open world game Mm -hmm. you can't just wander around rapture on your own you just go where the game tells you, and you do what 
Atlas, the character tells you to do. Mm-hmm. But you, you know, you're just doing that because like this is a game. Like right. this is this is I'm how just games are. This, yeah. I'm just playing through the game. Like yep. they don't give me the choice, so I'm just gonna do what I do and fight these big daddies and splicers, or whatever. Mm-hmm. Come to find out halfway through the game, or three quarters of the way through the game, that your character is a freaking like he's been mentally conditioned to do whatever someone says when they say. I'm sorry, big spoilers for for a 15 year old game, whatever. Yep. But would you kindly? Whenever someone says, "Would you kindly?" They have to do. He has to do what they say. So the fact you know the entire game, you realize this character has been saying, "Would you kindly? Would you kindly do this? Would you kindly do yeah, that? Yeah. Would you kindly do this?" And so like then the kind of meta narrative there is that it's a it's a commentary on video games on linear video games as a whole Mm -hmm. it's a commentary this was even before open world games were really popular yeah so all games for the most part were designed you have to do what we tell you to do and so bioshock essentially is a meta narrative about video games as a whole furthermore there's this really interesting narrative throughout the game where the monsters you're fighting the splicers Mm -hmm. they're all hopped up on this substance (laughs) called Adam. So it's really a heroin metaphor. It's like a a drug metaphor, but Mm -hmm. specifically heroin because they all are pursuing this substance that they can inject into their arms. And it's supposed to modify their DNA to give them a super ability. Exactly. Which is kind of vain, which is kind of a satire on the vanity of like plastic surgery or Mm -hmm. chasing after this look. Enhancement. Chasing after, yeah, yeah. Chasing after enhancement. The irony, though, is that you get through the game... In order to get through the game, in order to successfully succeed in the game, you, the character, the player, Jack, have to do the same. You have to get the, the, uh, what do they call it? I keep wanting to call them Vigors, but that's, that's, um, plasmids! The plasmids! plasmids. So, uh, you use these plasmids and you literally inject them into your arm. Because it's like blood plasma. And you get powers, yeah. Uh-huh. I get it. Okay. Yeah, so you use the plasmids to become more powerful, but that's exactly what the splicers are doing. So depending on how you play the game, they do give you choices and you get a different ending based on the choices. Yeah. But one of the ways that you can interpret the game is that you, Jack, are becoming, are fighting splicers, but you're becoming the very monster that you're fighting. Mm-hmm. So there's this sort of crazy meta narrative of like, you know, by trying, by using, trying to fight fire with fire, you actually become, you get burned up. You know what I mean? Like you become, you become the very monster that you try to defeat yeah. when you like, so, and then they get, it's, it's, it's even crazier in the other, in the other games. Um, and in the same way that like there was a huge drug problem in the late sixties, fifties, which is where the games mm-hmm. aesthetic kind of comes from. Like, and it was, was set in like a libertarian utopia. Yeah. A libertarian that, utopia no God, under no the government. sea, no gods, no, and they built no, a city yeah. under the sea, no gods, no a, Kings. That's what it is. That's yeah. It. yeah well, uh, no Andrew government. Ryan's thing. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, yeah. So they built the city underground, under, under the water. Sorry. The environment. Yeah. It's and so beautiful. It's, it's hidden from everything. It's, it's under what it's dark. Mm-hmm. It's, it's supposedly hidden from God and King. And right. King. So yep. it's mm-hmm. untouchable, right? Uh-huh. We can do whatever we want here. Yep. This is our society, our life, our thing, our money, our income. What is that famous line in the intro when you're in the uh, the lighthouse? No, you're in that the ball that goes underwater, the bathosphere, or whatever. You're yeah. in the bathosphere and you watch a projected video, and it's like there's this famous line in there that's it's basically like, "Have you? Do you think you deserve what you've earned, or like the sweat of your brow?" Uh, they make fun of it in, in Borderlands. Uh, yeah, Cloudtrap says because uh, <laughs> it's like. It's like, do you deserve the money you get? No, says the man, and no, says the man on Capitol Hill. Yeah, blah, blah, yeah, blah, that's blah. it. Yep. Uh, no, says the church. Like mm-hmm. in Borderlands, clapped clap the first Borderlands during one of the DLCs, mm-hmm. clap traps. Like, no, says the man at Hyperion. Your, or it's like, do you deserve the the work that comes from your brain? No, says the man at Hyperion. You are just a slave. No, says the Vault Hunter. It deserves to be splattered on the ground. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh my gosh, they are making fun of Bioshock right now. I yep. love it. Uh, so good. But yeah, so you have a yeah, libertarian setting, you know, 1940s, 50s it, it, yeah, time it's, frame. It's, like, it's meant to be like late 50s, kind of the cusp of the 60s, I think, oh, is okay. the aesthetic that they're going for. Mm-hmm. But again, what's interesting about that is there was actually like a big drug epidemic oh, during yeah. that time frame. Yeah. And so the whole, the whole, it was like the emergence of like heroin and needle-based drugs that would become a problem in the 60s and 70s mm-hmm. all the way through the 80s yeah um so they're hitting on that in in bioshock mm-hmm. and then what's even cooler is in bioshock infinite the vigors they're in the form of 
drinks. They're in the form of like medicine. Oh yeah, bottles. like cocktails. And everyone who sells them are totally because the game Bioshock Infinite, the style, the the motif is like turn of the century, like 1900s mm-hmm. through the 1920s, like right, right before World War cusp of World War One, pre Prohibition. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Right around Prohibition. So number one, they're kind of giving you vibes of Prohibition when you pop it and drink it right but then also the people who sell them are like like they're in the style of like snake oil salesmen uh yeah. so they're totally trying to like riff off this whole like do you want to be do you want to have super strength like yep. buy my little snake oil but the irony is the snake oil actually does do something so mm-hmm. games are genius the meta narrative within within the games is just again they're like through the gameplay itself through these things that you the player are like again you would you the player think oh i would never be tricked into buying snake oil that's stupid <laughs> but here you are you're like oh yeah give me that fireball give me that fireball <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah i would never i'm i would never do drugs i'm not that's i'm not that stupid but when you say like oh yeah this drug will give you the power to shock people you're all like yeah give me that give me that give me that i'll check that right into my I'm arm in. so Let's it's interesting go. the game kind of makes monsters of us all in a lot of ways mm. while also giving us a reason to be heroes yeah it's pretty cool so bioshock i don't think we need to, we need, it, there's so much good about the music, the setting, the atmosphere. The games are like this weird mix between sci-fi and horror, but they're genius. So yeah, just, fantastic. I just want I want to make sure we have time for other other games. So. I don't I don't think the uh, at least my my second pick isn't as artsy as Red Dead or as Bioshock. Okay, right? so this is like yeah, here's the big one. Now we're in my my secondary we'll sure. pick. Getting into something that you're like maybe more a little bit more subjective mm-hmm. for you. Right. Yeah, go ahead. So mm-hmm. Octopath Traveler okay. is my next pick. Yeah, uh, this is a Square Enix published game developed by the same folks who did Bravely Default and Bravely Second. Uh, it is done in the style of the Super Nintendo RPG, such as like Final Fantasy VI. So it's 16 bit pixel art. Uh, tell Total throwback. Completely throwback. Um, the art of the game, the art style is, they call it like HD 2D or something. It was some weird marketing. <laughs> but I understand what they're saying. It, it looks like a diorama, right? You make when you're in school with a little shoebox and you mm-hmm. like you put your pieces, cardboard and cotton balls together. But it's done in pixel art, so it's like complete nostalgia hit right off the bat. It's like, yeah. this is an art form for me, at least visually, literally because i'm a gamer yeah. from the 90s yeah. that uh-huh. played those rpgs yeah. right that's that's what they were going for okay well the art of the soundtrack that just br- draws you in uh i i tried to take a nap on this flight from hawaii to the united states it was a 10 hour flight i have 8 hours of game time on logged maybe a half hour to 45 minutes of that was me trying to sleep but i was listening to the soundtrack or i was just had it mm-hmm. on on my switch with headphones and i was just like Oh, this music is so good. And so it's kind of a high fantasy medieval ish time frame. So it has that style of like Irish Celtic sort of like music. I can't really describe music cause I'm not very well versed in how to describe music, Yeah, but it's going to have lots of stringed instruments. It's orchestral. It, it, it's done in such a way that draws you in. Um, you have eight different characters with eight different stories, but I'll just focus on one that impacted me. And that was Primrose. Mm-hmm. I and love she the dancer, right? The dance, quote unquote dancer. Yeah, it's a uh-huh. family friendly podcast. So the, the game, <laughs> but does, she is. She's called the dancer in is, the game yeah. too. That's her well, class. Because yeah. the game is is just as family friendly as we are. Uh-huh. But she has the most crazy, yeah, like brutal, old, brutal story. Yeah, where where it's all like they say orphan, it without saying it. They you do, know I mean? and it's they're so like, good. They're like. They're like, yeah, there's some pretty adult things going on, but we're not going to outright say it. We're just going to imply it. It was one of the most, I I played the demo and I picked Primrose Mm -hmm. and it was like, it was some of the best, like implicate, like use of the the idea of implication that I've ever seen. (laughs) I was like, oh my goodness. Mm -hmm. Like, wow. So orphaned as a young girl brought into a house of females, Mm -hmm. quote unquote, ran by a escort leader (laughs) goodness, who is oppressive and dismissive and abusive abusive extremely abusive yeah. uh and the girl is left with no hope and no other thing to turn to no income no family and no support system and because it's set in a medieval type society women in general didn't have a lot of options in mm-hmm. those times and so she had a goal to avenge her parents death but also to get revenge on her oppressor from an early age and so that was her start with the end in mind. She did that yeah. and worked her way, worked the system, bought into the system, but played as if she was submitting like as a 
woman should submit, quote unquote, but not sure, really. Sure. Yeah. And worked her way all the way up to the point where she actually does get the revenge and and kills the oppressor. Nice. Yeah. And you get that like, yeah, justice is served. But at the same time, you're like, this happens in real life. Mm-hmm. This is so relatable. This is yeah. so like it brings you down to those level. Like you read these articles online of the trafficking that happens and like how how women are in modern society and how you know, in stigmatisms or well, that's not even the word I'm looking for. The stigmatic sexism that's in our society mm-hmm. of like equal pay rights. Yeah. Um. I, this is not a political podcast, but like even the discussion of abortion is around women's white rights and women's discussions and stuff. So like this game just brings all that to you without, yeah. e- without even putting it in your face. Right. Yeah. As we discussed, this is, is like a PG, it's a teen rated game. Mm-hmm. So there's no nudity. There's no like actual references to these heavy topics that are very adult oriented, mm-hmm. but it brings you down to that level in the yeah. thought process. And that's art. Yep, like I agree. Yeah. And, and it's done artfully and masterfully and in tastefully a way, yeah and tastefully mm-hmm. yeah and, and you have fun like i said earlier with my description of what fun means mm-hmm. it's like that doesn't sound fun if i just described that <laughs> but it is fun yeah yeah cool octopath awesome. traveler i, I, that's only I one wish i could eight. comment on it there's one of those it was it was a pick that you had that i it's on my list of games that i want to play yeah. but i just haven't gotten a chance to play it so mm-hmm. i can't i can't really other than my other than my brief like uh but again it brings up like you have eight different characters all who, you know, again, I, I can't speak for all of their stories, mm-hmm. but like just, you know, the depth and richness of that one character. Mm-hmm. It's like the like the worst case scenario is that like it still stands out. You know what I mean? Like it's like all the other characters kind of have shallow stories, but hers mm-hmm. stands out. Best case scenario is all eight of those stories are all richly, yeah. deeply interesting. In one the of the other way. ones that was also a note of mine was like a super smart. Um, I think he was an alchemist. So he was like really sciencey and yeah. like in the in the church rejected like completely just out like and someone else getting the credit for your work. So I I, I can't go into details because my memory is so foggy. But even dealing with that like mm-hmm. that's so relatable. It's like yeah. other people getting credit for the things you do. How often does that happen mm-hmm. in school and academia and in your professional life? Now like do the stories from my understanding like the stories all kind of converge though right yep. into one big kind of super story. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I think that's a really it was still a very bold choice to be like, hey, we're gonna tell like. It's almost Games of Thrones. It's like Song of Ice and Fire, where it's mm-hmm. like, here's all these scattered characters who are all separated by straight up geography, and we're gonna start the story by telling all their stories separately, and then bring them all together. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and each of, of them have their own motivations, mm-hmm. and yeah. they're all gonna have their selfish outplays, yep. but they all work together as a party against a common goal. Yet they all have their like individual goals yeah. too. Cool. So I didn't. I never actually beat it. Oh, nice. I got pretty far into it, but yeah. I never actually beat it. So. You were borrowing it or something? No, I own it. Oh, you own it? Mm-hmm. That's what I want to borrow. I know. <laughs> That's how you own it? Yeah. I thought I told you, and you're like, you I don't have it. And then, okay. No, whatever. I never told you. All right, I don't all, right, have all, right, it. all right, all right, all right. <laughs> cool. My f- second pick, second pick, fourth game to talk about, second pick, is um, I was actually kind of mulling over this because there were some good ones. So I want to kind of hit some honorable mentions. I was definitely torn. I thought I wanted to talk about Sending a Sacrifice. But I've talked about Sending a Sacrifice. I don't think I would have anything else to say beyond what I've already said about mm-hmm. it. So I unfortunately can't point you to an episode I talk about. Yeah, I've talked no about idea. Sending a Sacrifice on a handful because, of Because the nature of favorite things in DLC, yeah, yeah. we have no clue yeah, when we talk about things somewhere. that we like. Yeah. So if you guys want to hear my thoughts on it, if there's like an outcry, we want to hear about Hellblade Sending a Sacrifice from Penguin, then I'll tell you about it. But I figured it was worth honorably mentioning. Game's genius. Makes you feel like you have mental illness. So it makes you feel like you can relate. Awesome. The game I want to talk about, though, the game I actually was like, you know what, I haven't talked about this game a lot, and I think it qualifies as art to me, is South Park Fractured Butthole. Yes. And the reason I want to talk about that game, number one, the reason I ended up landing on it is comedy is often left out of artistic conversations. It is. It's it's almost talked about as if it's its own thing. Like, oh, well, comedy is just comedy. But I think that comedy, again, comedy not only is objectively art, like you can't say that comedy is not art, uh, straight up evolved. Comedy evolved alongside tragedy, Mm -hmm. uh, and in, in freaking Greek theater. So in the history of, of theater, we had comedy that grew up alongside tragedy. Isn't there an old age definition of comedy that's not what we think it is? Uh, comedies are typically, you know, you can, you could, comedies don't necessarily have to be funny. The, the, the actual definition of comedy is, or old-timey definition, I should mm-hmm. say, is um, it just has to have a happy ending. 
Just oh, the, the happy ending. Happy okay. ending Which versus sad Which is the opposite ending. of tragedy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Happy ending versus sad ending mm-hmm. is more or less what, what comedy is. Beyond just straight up comedy, there were also plays, the word the word satire yes. comes from the word satyr, the S-A-T-Y-R, mm-hmm. which is satyr is like a little trickster demon yep. in Greek mythology. So they had these things called satyr plays, which were, <laughs> let's just say they were celebrations of fertility. <laughs> <laughs> was their origin. Oh my. Let's just say it was a bunch of dudes running around uh, with uh, certain objects strapped to them. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that were meant to imply certain things. Um, ridiculous plays, um, but it's where we get the term satire from because it's kind of, again, they were meant to, not only were they meant to make people laugh, but through that kind of rudimentary version of comedy, they were meant to like have it make a statement on something and right. kind of like criticize mm-hmm. the culture so that's where we get the idea of satire and so both comedy Any stand-up you watch on hbo or netflix does just that yeah exactly so both comedy and satire they're more or less synonymous although you, you it's a kind of like all satire is comedy but not all comedy is satire right but anyways uh south park kind of is in my mind one of the greatest satires and comedies of our time for oh absolutely reason. because of the social commentary they make they kind of sit, sit there and like they pick apart and they've been doing it for 20 years. They've, they've picked apart modern society and kind of broken it down and said, this is why this is ridiculous. This is why we are ridiculous. Yep. Um, and therefore, making a statement. Therefore, like having that pathological that I talked about, that pathological impression. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's just the show. So why why pick the game? Why say, okay, well, great. They have a game based off of a, a really funny show. Like, why is, why is this art? Because they don't just the, – what the reason I picked it is because they don't just – they go a step further. They don't just comment. They're not just making satire on society mm-hmm. through Fractured But Whole. Don't get me wrong. They are. They make fun of the whole Marvel movie, movie yeah, franchise, superhero franchise thing. That's the whole root of the game is to, is to completely rag on the whole <laughs> cinematic universe thing. That's what the characters – that's what their motivations are. They're both – they're trying to they, – they have a they have a civil war because they yep. try to – they think one thinks that their cinematic universe idea is better and they all have their own superhero identities. It's great. But it's not just a commentary on that. It's a, the the gameplay and everything. It's a it's a it makes fun of video games. It's a mm-hmm. con, it's another one of those commentaries. In the same way that Bioshock was a tragic commentary on video games, Fractured But Whole is a comedy commentary on video games and everything. Not only is the game so stylistically perfect for South Park, like literally they recreate the look and feel of a South Park episode Two. in the game and it's perfect it's beautiful it's perfect it doesn't it, it plays when you're playing it you're like oh my gosh i'm in south park and i like it's hard to describe other than you have to just do it mm-hmm. but then like they again they make fun of like everything from like the tragic backstory that you have to choose for your character as you go like you make choices like i'm choosing to do this i'm choosing my class based on like they give you like straight up like here's a comic this is your backstory based on your class or whatever like yeah. and so they do that while also like the best part is i want to talk about the yaoi collection like down to yes. the, the collectibles so the the game is full of all these collectibles <laughs> to get the trophies or whatever you have to get the collectibles and what does the word yaoi mean and the yaoi i don't know what it means but what yaoi is I, i'm afraid to google it but i'm <laughs> no, going to God. yaoi basically is japanese anime art like manga style art depicting it's kind of like fanfic depicting beloved characters in homosexual relations yeah we, um, also known as boys love boys or bl love, yeah. is a genre of fictional media originating in japan that features homoerotic relationships between male characters homoerotic yeah 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 exactly Homo, uh, totally, i'll just leave you with that yeah that's 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 probably about as family friendly as you can get yep so the game makes you go around and collect yaoi. It doesn't make you, but like you optionally can go around and collect this yaoi art. The reason why I think that's a genius, the reason why I think that's, again, such a commentary on video games is A, it's a commentary, like, it, it, it's a commentary on like going around and collecting useless stuff, mm-hmm. uh, which is totally a video game trope. Yep. But the, the nature of what you're collecting is such a criticism of gamers, because gamers, of all people, like, they make you go around and collect the very thing that gamers would kind of hate, <laughs> because gamers tend to be a little homophobic. They kind of, 
veer towards being a little on the no, homophobic we've talked, side. We've talked about the toxicity yeah. in gaming culture, uh, and, and so to be, we know, you know that it's changing. The fact that like calling someone gay on like in a game is like the worst insult you can you yeah. can make to someone. You know, again in a game, quote unquote, worst insult. So the fact that South Park's like, yeah, so the collectibles that you obsess over, we want you to go around and collect boy love art. <laughs> it's just kind of again, it's in irony, face, it's yep. satire, it's meant to make you be like, it's. Me- it's meant to make you like kind of uncomfortable, but also it's kind of hilarious. Like it's it, awesome. It it's it, it's truly is making you feel multiple things at once. So mm-hmm. genius, hilarious. I don't think comedy again. If you talk about art as like making you feel something, like and make and having making you think, like mm-hmm. making you feel something, having a, having an emotional reaction, and then that emotional reaction triggering a thought process to make you kind of question, huh? Maybe I should reconsider things or or maybe you know i haven't really thought about this in this way yeah like again south park fractured butthole is genius in that regard it really truly kind of challenges (laughs) you while also like it it, you know it challenges you but it does so by first breaking down your barrier making you crack up so it makes you so it takes your defensiveness away because you're like oh this is just a fun Mm -hmm. hilarious game like and you may not change your mind about you may not end up changing your mind about gay rights or whatever by collecting yaoi art but, but it should hopefully challenge you to think of the world differently if you don't already. Exactly, yeah. So kind of ironic, uh, or so yeah. Good, good, um, good use of comedy, good use of satire to mm-hmm. kind of make you feel something while having again that just sort of fun. That's just one small example about yeah, that game. the gameplay. Again, it makes because the you... story, the narrative that you walk through is. <laughs> hysterical and it's awesome and, and, but... uh, yeah well i just love the other and again other gameplay choices where it's like depending on your skin color the game will be harder the game will be harder by making it so that you get less money yep you get less resources yeah. that's a statement like yep. <laughs> the statement is hey some people have disadvantages based on the color of their skin yeah and we're going to make you literally experience it if you want to get the platinum trophy in that game you literally Which i did have, well you did yep if you want to get the platinum in that game, you literally have to experience what it's like to have fewer resources available to you as a black person. Yeah. It's, it's a satire on privilege. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's, yep. it's that. Genius. It's yep. so good. So I would say that, again, I've only played through the game once. Talking about it makes me want to play through it more. Mm-hmm. But again, like just talking about like it's taking these holistic choices. It's taking its comedic choices, but it's taking its gameplay choices. It's taking its character design. All of that is designed specifically to make you think, make you about these very topical things, to challenge you on these very topical things, while at the same time doing so in a way that kind of gets you off guard and and catches you by surprise. Mm-hmm. Um, and so therefore I think it's, you know, again, I don't necessarily agree with all their politics, but I'm willing to think about it. I'm willing to entertain it. I'm mm-hmm. willing to have a conversation, quote unquote, with them about it mm-hmm. because they disarm me in a way that's like they take me off the defensive by making me laugh. And, and then I have a good time and I go, okay, yeah, like it doesn't necessarily have to change my conclusions or change my politics or change my mind, but it still got me to think. And therefore I grow as a result of it. Mm-hmm. So that's just kind of, yeah, right. I think that that's, that is art to a T. Like if, you, if, mm-hmm. if, if art should do one thing, it's like, it makes you kind of grow as a person. It makes you think it makes you, it makes you, it forces you to really truly consider yourself and your place in the world. Um, and uh, there's not a better way of doing that. I think than comedy, I think comedy is, is truly yeah. underappreciated in regards to the artistic world. People, when people think of art, they think of like, oh, yes, very, oh, very I'm going to sip my glass deeply, of expensive wine mm, and look at this sculpture. Deeply challenging by this thing. But like you can be challenged too by crap, by laughing. So, oh, yeah. um, by fart jokes. Yeah. By, yeah exactly. <laughs> Gosh, uh, there's so many good examples in just the show, yep. uh, to the game too. So good. So, yeah, that was, those go. were my two choices. Yeah. So, cool. I really wish that we had time to talk about some other ones that we had both agreed upon, like God of War. But we've talked, again, we talked to death about yeah, God did. of War. We've talked about death about Horizon Zero Dawn. If you have other examples out there, things that we want to hit on, like, again, we love this topic. We love this discussion. I think it's something we're both very passionate about. Mm-hmm. Even though it might be more of a penguiny topic, I do think that, like, it's one that, like, you can get passionate about oh, as well. Oh, absolutely, yeah. So uh, we are happy to revisit this idea anytime our fans want. So if you have games that you're like, hey, we think you should talk about this as art. If we have played it, we would love to talk about it. If we haven't played it, we'll check it out. And then we would love to play it, evaluate for ourselves, whether we want to discuss it. And, yep. uh, and, um, yeah. So we love this idea of games as art. So if you think there's a game out there, you're just like, this is the most artistic game. This is the game that has such a, had a huge impression on me that I've grown as a person as a result of it. We want to hear from you. So 
as I said earlier, you can go to 80bitpodsmash.com. That's our landing website. It has links to everywhere we are. Uh, it's because I said it already. I won't go into all of that, but I'll do a little <laughs> twist. Go to Facebook and share us on your feed so that your friends can see that you like us. Mm-hmm. Share a specific episode or thought. If you want to tag us on Facebook, unfortunately, you have to have the hyphen. It's the only time it ever matters. Mm-hmm. It's dumb. Uh, I have to go change that, and I spent way too much time trying to do it, and I haven't figured it out yet. Uh, also, on iTunes, if you go there and leave us a review, that's how we can get bubbled up through iTunes and Apple's algorithms to be discovered by new folks who want to discover what a video game podcasts they might want to listen to. So please go there and review us. We would appreciate a five-star review, but be honest. <laughs> yeah. I would actually mm-hmm. appreciate more honesty than anything else. Yep. And you can write your text review along with the stars as well if you have yep. issues with us so mm-hmm. or not. Or if you have praises for us, uh-huh. please leave them there. Yep. Please go to our subreddit, 80 bit pod smash, r slash 80 bit pod smash. And, uh, and if you want to have conversations with us or if you want to have conversations with other pod smashers, if you just like listen to this podcast and are like fuming because you have ideas you want to share or thoughts you want to share or criticisms, that's the place to start a thread. As far as we know, there's no nothing preventing anyone there's no moderation in place that prevents anyone from starting a thread yep. depending on the content of your thread we may have to remove it but that's not our intention we want as you know as much as possible we want it to be a free place where people can freely discuss any thoughts that they might have had whether it's dlc mm-hmm. that has sparked an idea for you or whether it's uh uh the main content we want to hear your thoughts so in this case we want to hear if there's games that you think are artistic or if you have further thoughts on the games we've already talked about so yes all right definitely go check out episode one if you haven't it's a fun time if this if this conversation has interested you that's a that's a topic that you can listen more about there in that episode wow words uh but otherwise hope you guys have a good week see you next week